The proceeding will start shortly. 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 Order, order. We start with questions to the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care. Sarah Britliff. Oh, Mr Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And may I just start by wishing the Honourable Member for Ilford North a speedy recovery. Uh, we are taking a wide-ranging approach to alcohol harms. Some £27 million has been invested in specialist alcohol care teams in a quarter of hospitals with the highest need. And we have published the first ever UK-wide clinical guidelines for harmful drinking and alcohol dependence, as well as providing more than £300 million, uh, or around £300 million, I should say, in funding to 75 local authorities through the Family Hubs and Start for Life programme uh, and Family Hubs funded through this programme are encouraged to provide full wraparound support for families, which it may indeed include alcohol support Sorry, services. Mr Speaker, to the Government's credit, it is currently putting money into addiction services. However, at the same time, there is no national strategy for children of alcohol-dependent parents. Now, that has not always been the case. Between tw 2017 and 2021, there were local and national helpline services funded through a national strategy. Can I ask the Secretary of State if she will meet with me to discuss this, as the children in these awful situations are some of the most vulnerable <coughs> in society? Well, may I thank my honourable friend for her um, uh, care and also uh, for sharing her experiences on this subject. Uh, through the drug strategy, we have committed an extra £532 million of funding over three years to improve alcohol and drug treatment services, with £15.7 million invested in Lancashire. And last year, we saw a further £2.8 million invested nationally, in line with guidance for the extra drug strategy funding which allows local authorities to fund targeted services for parents in need of treatment and support for their children and families. But I will, of course, be very happy to meet her to discuss this further. Barry Sherman, briefly. Mr Speaker, <laughs> <laughs> I've turned over a new leaf, Mr Speaker. <laughs> can, can I urge the Secretary of State to take this issue very seriously and direct much more social media to young people to get into schools about the real damage to the entire life of a child if the mother is drinking alcohol during pregnancy. Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for bringing uh, uh, some insight into how we can best reach families. Of course, it's not just mums, it's, it's also fathers or um, carers uh, who can have a huge impact on our children. But this is why my uh, right honourable friend, the Minister for um, the Start for Life programme, is investing so much energy and commitment into our family hubs because we do believe that these can be the centre for families to really make the very best start to a child's life. Sarah Green. Number two, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Discharging people on time is better for them and frees up hospital beds. We're changing how our health system works to do this, joining up health and social care and care transfer hubs, helping people recover at home with over 10,000 new virtual ward beds, and investing in social care and it's working. Last month, delayed discharges were down 9% compared to the end of December 2022, despite almost 1,000 extra urgent admissions to hospitals every day in December. Mr Speaker, nearly one in six beds in my local healthcare trust in Buckinghamshire continue to be occupied by patients fit for discharge. 
A recent King's Fund report found that the Government's current practice of providing one-off funding to reduce delays, whilst welcome, comes with insufficient advance notice to allow for effective planning. So can I ask the Minister what steps her department is taking to ensure the best use of this funding? Well, one reason why we distributed discharge funding back in uh, April last year was to give more advance notice to organisations so that they could put in place what's needed to speed up discharges. And I'll say to her, our plan is working. And that's why, in her own trust, discharges in December, at the end of December, were down by a third compared to a year before. Delayed discharge, noting the progress um, the, my honourable friend referenced, is still a, a major issue. And pa patient flow through a hospital is a critical factor, especially at the front door in terms of emergency departments. We know the role that um, bed management systems, electronic bed management systems, can play in helping that flow. What steps is my honourable friend taking to ensure that more hospitals roll out this technology? Well, my uh, honourable friend is absolutely right, and I know how much work he did when he had oversight of yeah, urgent yeah. and emergency care services, including his contribution to our urgent emergency care recovery plan, which we published almost a year ago, which included a host of steps to improve the flow through hospitals, including investment in bed management systems, as he described. And this plan is working. That's why we're improving through flu hospitals and seeing reductions in delayed discharges. Bob Roberts. Question three, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. NHS data shows that we have delivered on our manifesto commitment for an extra 50,000 NHS nurses early, with the, with the number of nurses working in our NHS increasing from around 301,000 in 2019 to 357,000 today. This has been achieved through boosting training and education routes, ethically recruiting internationally, and actions to improve retention. Measures such as the Health and Care Visa introduced in 2020 support international recruitment. Thank the Minister for his answer. As he knows, the National Health Service would completely collapse without the input and expertise of clinical staff from around the world. One of the barriers to those people coming to help us is that fees for applying for permanent residency are so high, and some of the nurses from countries like India and the Philippines are having to take out expensive loans just to feel like they're welcome and able to stay in our country. I've tabled a private member's bill to exempt NHS clinical staff from paying these high fees to become residents. Will the Minister support me with this bill and work with his Home Office colleagues to find a way to make this a reality for those people who work so hard in our health service? Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, I would join with my honourable friend in paying tribute to the enormous contribution made by internationally recruited staff to our NHS. As he will know, immigration policy and fees are a matter for my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary. However, our long-term workforce plan is supporting international recruitment. In addition to the new visa route, we are exempting health and care staff from the immigration health surcharge. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the will know that without our fantastic workforce, the NHS would not work. Yeah. And I pay tribute to those hard working nurses across all our, our hospitals and, and care settings, including the ones at St Thomas's Hospital in my constituency. Does the Minister recognise that in addition to retaining staff, we have to look in recruiting staff, we have to look at retention of the current staff. Yes. They argue in terms of the workload, their mental well being, the fact that the cost of living crisis is having a big impact. Does the Minister agree that to address this, the government needs to come forward with a wide ranging plan on addressing workforce planning pay, train and staff well-being and retention. Well, I completely agree with the Honourable Lady, which is why this Government became the first Government ever to introduce a long-term workforce plan. Retention is one of the key pillars of the long-term workforce plan, and we are already seeing that deliver on results of keeping more staff in our NHS. Leila Brown. Before Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, with your permission, I will take questions 4, 7 and 18 together. I am determined to make sure that everybody who needs NHS dental care can receive it. We have already implemented a package of reforms to improve access and provide fairer remuneration for dentists, and this has had an effect, with 1.7 million more adults being seen, 800,000 more children being seen, and a 23 per cent increase in NHS activity in the past year. But we know we need to do much more, and our dentistry recovery plan will be published shortly, setting out a big package of change. 
Speaker, I listened to what the Minister said carefully. That change has not come to Oxfordshire for sure. It's in a dire state. An Oxford resident wrote to me to say that when his NHS practice closed, he rang a dozen others across the county, each one offering, saying they were offering NHS services, and in fact they weren't. They were only offering private care. In this cost of living crisis, people simply cannot afford to do that. And as a result, they're going into A&E and they're waiting not to get treatment, and that ends up in oral surgery. So what is the Minister doing now to improve the situation in Oxfordshire and across the country? Yeah, yeah. Minister. Well, I am incredibly sympathetic to what the Honourable Lady says. In fact, in Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire and Berkshire West ICB, the number of adults seen by an NHS dentist has risen in the 24 months up to June 2023 from 448,000 to 485,000, with similar increase in percentage of children seen. So the situation is improving, but I completely agree with her. We need to do more, and we will be coming forward shortly with a big package of dental recovery plan reforms. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to uh, thank my right honourable friend for her answer. Following my very productive meeting only a few days ago with her, um, can she confirm that NHS England locally has finally been unblocked and that my constituents in Clacton can soon benefit from more dentists practicing on NHS patients? Minister. Well, um, as my honourable friend will know, this is a local matter and it is for his ICB to determine whether they wish to support the excellent pilot proposal for overseas dental students in Clacton, whilst at the same time they need to ensure that their actions are compliant with current legislation and within the delegation agreement with NHS England. I have just written to my honourable friend about this, and my letter should address his concerns, but of course I'll be happy to see him again if he has any further questions. Rachel Maskell. Mr Speaker, we were promised before the summer, we were promised after the summer, we were promised before, <laughs> we, before Christmas, we were promised soon, and now we've been promised shortly. <laughs> the reality is, is that our benches have got a plan and the government have not got a plan. Exactly. And in York, we cannot get an NHS dentist yeah. either. Blossom Street practice is just handing back its contract my constituents have nowhere to go. So what is the Minister going to do to ensure my constituents can access NHS dentistry? Well, as I said to the Honourable Lady earlier, I absolutely understand the challenge for some people. The situation has improved over the last year. Since the COVID pandemic, where almost every dentist had to stop working altogether, we've not seen the recovery we want to see. And we're putting in plans, not a paper ambition like the members opposite have put forward, but some really significant reforms that will enable more people, many more people, to be seen by NHS dentists. But I would just gently say to the Honourable Lady that a recent Health Services Journal article states that Humber and North Yorkshire ICB has indicated in board papers that dentistry funding will be squeezed to help them balance their books. So I would encourage her to talk to her ICB about this too. Thank you, Mr Speaker. For new patients, accessing an NHS dentist in Peterborough is almost impossible. But should a new medical centre wish to establish a new NHS dental practice, but in doing so would require flexibility in UDA rates and would require the ability to recruit dentists from overseas, would the Minister give that effort her enthusiastic support and encourage NHS bosses to do the same? Ah. Well, my honourable friend is pushing against an open door. In fact, he might be aware that in, um, that in 2022, the General Dental Council um, had received some legislative changes, in fact, in 23, so that they could have more flexibility to expand the registration options open to international dentists. They've tripled the capacity of three sittings of the overseas registration exam from August 23 and increased the number of sittings for the Part 2 exam in 24 from three to four. This will create an additional 1,300 places overall for overseas dentists aiming to work in the UK. We will also be bringing forward measures to enable dental therapists to work at the top of their training. That will expand the capacity, but he's right, it also requires reform of the UDA and we'll be bringing forward our plans shortly. Shadow Minister, please. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I want to share with ministers the experience of Emma from Grimsbury. She said, I quote, 
NHS dentistry is a joke in the town at the moment. Thankfully, I managed to get an emergency appointment in Scunthorpe after being offered one in Doncaster originally, and now I've been referred to hospital to have three wisdom teeth removed. My dentist closed at the onset of the pandemic, and I've not been able to register with an NHS dentist since. What does the Minister have to say to Emma and the millions like her who can't get an appointment when they need one? Thank yeah. you. Yeah. The Honourable Lady is absolutely right to point this out, and Emma has my absolute sympathy and apology for the fact that since the COVID pandemic, we have not seen the recovery of dentistry that we would like to have seen. What I can tell her that it is that in July 2022, we already created significant reforms to encourage dentists to take on more NHS patients. We recognise that we need to do more. The long-term workforce plan will increase training places. The overseas registration will improve capacity, as will the changes to the dental therapist um, programmes. And so all of these things will improve things, but in the meantime, we will be bringing forward our recovery plan very soon, which will immediately expand the incentives to NHS dentists. I will. Yeah. Question number five, Mr Speaker. Stay. Mr Speaker, our plan includes opening 5,000 more beds, increasing ambulance capacity, expanding innovative services such as virtual wards and bringing forward COVID and flu vaccinations for the most vulnerable. Thanks to the hard work of staff, NHS performance this winter has improved on last year, despite the impact of industrial action. I'm sure the caveat to that, Mr Speaker, was the word shortly. Mr Speaker, I've had constituents contact me in desperation regarding delays at Penderfields Hospital in my constituency. Constituents tell me that they've waited hours this winter, literally all day in some cases, in emergency care for routine blood tests, even whilst in extremely poor health. The Tories' patchwork reforms and sticking plaster politics isn't fooling anyone. Does the Secretary of State not think that these dangerously long waiting times are a damning indictment of 14 years of Conservative mismanagement? And what does she say to my constituents who are suffering right now? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, I'm sure that the Honourable Gentleman is a fair man, and in being such a fair man, he will point out to his constituents when they call him uh, with their issues that, in fact, his local area ambulance response times for Category 2 emergency incidents have been over 30 minutes faster than last year. Uh, But we do, of course, accept that uh, this is a two-year plan, and it will take time to meet our full ambitions. But interestingly as well, his NHS trust uh, met the, um, the latest pub, uh, in the local area. Uh, the uh, f- latest figures show that we have provided £6.9 million from the Community Diagnostic Centre's Diagnostics Fund for development of a community diagnostic centre at Wakefield. So, presumably, he will welcome that Conservative innovation. Yeah. Chair of the Select Committee, Steve Bryan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, the pressure on services this winter is. Is, is acute. It is every year. We have heard very little mention so far today in 20 minutes of the biggest headache facing trusts, ICBs, patients and, of course, the Prime Minister's pledge to further cut the waiting list. Given the BMA ballot on consultants' action closes today and the doctors in training dispute continues, can the Secretary of State up the, update the House on her message to those voting today and where we are on the wider industrial disputes, which is drag anchor on the NHS right now? Uh, well, may I thank my honourable friend for his question. He's quite right to um, point out that we're in the final uh, few hours of the consultant's ballot on the uh, pay reform programme that we have offered to the British Medical Association. I very much hope that consultants will feel able to support this programme because it is very much about bringing together uh, the Uh, frankly quite bureaucratic system they have to deal with at the moment so that they are assessed in a shorter period of time with less bother, less paperwork, whilst respecting uh, very much their needs to train and to to keep up their education and and SPA um, uh, commitments. So I very much hope they will agree with us on this. Uh, But uh, going forward, as I have said to the Junior Doctors Committee at this dispatch box, should they return with reasonable expectations, then we will, of course, uh, reopen. Open negotiations. General Minister Currents. 
Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Minister has said that preparation for winter started last January, but still in December, 54% of A&E departments were reported as inadequate or needing improvement, exacerbating the winter crisis. So what will she be doing differently this year to ensure we don't have another winter crisis in 2024-25? Well, again, the plan that we laid out last year is having a real impact uh, at local level on the services that are being deployed through uh, our accident emergency um, services. Uh, we have seen, for example, uh, discharge rates improving. We appreciate it's not, it's, uh, there can be uh, local differences, but the importance that we put on ensuring we maintain that flow through hospitals is critical to ensuring that the waiting lists and waiting times that she describes uh, are reduced. I would gently remind uh, the party opposite, however, that of course they themselves uh, have been running the NHS in Wales now for some time, and it is a great shame, it is a great shame that the good people of Wales, the good people of Wales are waiting longer for their treatment, uh, almost twice as likely. Oh, 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 oh. I'm just a little bit bothered. I have a long way to go on the order paper. <laughs> SNP spokesperson Amy Callaghan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, we can't discuss winter pressures on the NHS without recognising workforce shortages. The Secretary of State is having to contend with new immigration policies from her Cabinet colleagues, prohibiting dependents from coming to the UK, asking people to come and care for our loved ones whilst leaving theirs. I can imagine the Secretary of State would be frustrated that this is now another barrier in place to recruit staff into our health and care sector. Has she expressed these frustrations to Cabinet colleagues? Well, I genuinely want to work with um, the Scottish Government because I am troubled, I have to put it uh, bluntly, with that Scotland has some of the worst health outcomes in Western Europe. They have the worst level of drug death rates in Europe. They have the highest alcohol death rates in 14 years, and there is a fall in life expectancy uh, for three years in a row. We have offered to allow Scottish patients to receive life-saving operations in England, but sadly this has been declined. But I remain genuinely willing to work with the Scottish Government to help them with their health service. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question six. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. We are investing an extra £2.3 billion a year to expand mental health services in England, uh, with the aim of enabling 2 million more people, including 345,000 more children and young people, to access mental health support. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Many constituents in Tamworth are coming to me in desperate need of support for their children, like Kate, whose daughter is at crisis point and has been without a psychiatrist since November, Roger, who has been waiting 18 months for an autism referral for his daughter, and similarly, Jess, for an ADHD assessment for her son. Will the Minister explain what action she is taking so that children, parents and families in my constituency can get the support that they need? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Well, just the investment that we're putting in in her local area in particular, there are a number of initiatives to help support children and young people with their mental health. There's the Sandbox uh, box, uh, scheme, which uh, supports those in the South Staffs area, which is a funded NHS services. There's Maliki, providing family support across Tamworth and East Staffs. Combined Wellbeing, which covers North Staffs, which is an online resource. There's the Family and Health Wellbeing Service. There's Action for Children for those aged 5 to 18 with mild to moderate mental health health needs and Staffordshire Emotional Wellbeing Services age 5 to 18. I would recommend that her constituents do look those up because we are funding those services to improve uh, mental health care for children in her local area. George Freeman. Speaker, the agony and damage of undiagnosed and untreated mental health is nowhere more acute than in rural areas where we see an epidemic of silent suffering. The Norfolk and Suffolk Foundation Trust has long struggled a series of management problems. I am sure the Minister has seen the recent report highlighting that between 2019 and 22. We saw over 8,500 avoidable deaths, that's nearly 45 a week, which she agreed to meet with me and the North and Suffolk MPs and those affected to look at what's really gone on here and make sure that we turn this trust into a beacon of the best <coughs> mental health services rather than the worst. Yeah. Well, I thank my honourable friend for raising this. We were holding regular meetings with Norfolk and Suffolk MPs, with the Trust and with the CQC as well, and NHS England. And with the new management team, they did appear to be turning things around uh, finally. But I am concerned to hear uh, the points that he's raised. I'm very happy to restart those meetings and will ask my office to arrange uh, that as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Wherever we look in the NHS, it's incredible. Oh, sorry, question eight, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Care is a skilled profession, and I want care workers to get the support and recognition they deserve. This month, we took the next step in our ambitious care workforce reforms, publishing the first ever national career structure for the care workforce, alongside our new nationally recognised care qualification. Uh, amb- ambitious care work reforms, Ms. Brick, it's all blah, isn't it? We've got 14 years of a Conservative government and we've got crisis in every area of the NHS. Now, in job insecurity, poor working conditions, low pay, where one in five of care workers are living in poverty, are reasons that, that we have a crisis in recruitment and retention in s- social care. Isn't it the truth that that is a damning indictment after 14 years of a Conservative government and the only thing that's going to sort out social care and the crisis in recruitment and retention is a general election? I'm actually really shocked by the way in which the Honourable Member referred to the care workforce with terms like it's all blood. Very shocking. I'm determined that care workers should get the recognition that they deserve. We have a 10-year plan for social care, and it's working. The care workforce grew by over 20,000 last year. Vacancies in social care are down. Retention is up. We are reforming social care so it works as a career. That's why, as I just said a moment earlier, and I wish the Honourable Member had been listening, we've introduced the first ever career pathway for social care workers and a new national care qualification. But according to Care England and HFT, 54% of social care providers have increased their reliance on agency staff. 44% have turned down new admissions and 18% had to close services altogether. Labour's fair pay agreements will ensure staff in the sector are treated with the dignity and respect that will make them want to stay. But after 14 years, why do ministers not have a proper plan to address the workforce crisis facing adult social care? Is it because it's a crisis of their making? We have a plan for the social care workforce, and it's working. The social care workforce increased by over 20,000 last year, and it is still going up. But I'll take no lectures from the honourable member. In fact, his colleague on the front bench, literally early this morning on the television, made it clear that Labour don't have a plan for social care. Or if they do, it's clear it will cost a lot of money, and it's yet another unfunded Labour plan. Sir David Abbott. Number nine, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Can I uh, assure my right honourable friend that this government is committed to improving uh, men's health? That's why in November we announced a suite of measures, including a £16 million fund for a new prostate cancer screening trial and the recruitment of a men's health ambassador, with also the launch of our men's health task force to tackle the biggest health issues facing men. David. I thank the Minister for that answer and would urge her to continue to make men's health a top priority. In particular, can can she make some work into looking how we can detect prostate cancer better and sooner, because that's the most common cause of male cancer in the United Kingdom, and anything can be done to reduce that number will be most, most welcome. Well, can I thank my right honourable friend and uh, uh, male colleagues on, on this side of the House, including the honourable member for Don Valley, who are fighting so hard to improve men's health. He is absolutely right. 12,000 men die a year from prostate cancer. That is why we are investing in the £16 million prostate cancer trial uh, called Transform, using methods like MRI to detect prostate cancer rather than uh, PSA, which can be inaccurate. Thousands of men will be recruited. We're hoping to st- that trial will start in the spring with the recruitment in the altar, autumn, including black men who are disproportionately affected by prostate cancer rates. Tim. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, would she agree, though, that the information she's just talked about, about why screening doesn't happen for men uh, for prostate cancer, is based on a study that is 20 years old? The fact that there are 12,000 deaths a year, biggest killer amongst men, biggest killer amongst, second biggest killer amongst all people, and yet here, here is this... Uh, 
evil cancer for which there is no screening programme whatsoever. So will she take steps to update current NHS guidance to ensure that all those at high risk of prostate cancer receive targeted early detection services? I think she's hinted that she may be doing that. But will she finally introduce mass screening for prostate cancer? It is the only cancer without specifically commissioned early diagnosis work, and men are dying unnecessarily because of the failure to bring this into being. Well, we've more than hinted, and we've just announced a £16 million uh, pilot study of prostate cancer screening. We have a plan to tackle those 12,000 deaths a year, and it will work. Because up until now, we've not had a diagnostic test. PSA is not a sensitive test in all prostate cancers. There are many men with prostate cancer that don't express PSA. That's why the TRANSFORM study, using uh, detection tools like MRI, will be trialled, and if they are effective, will be rolled out across the country. Karen McCarthy. Mr. Uh, Mr Speaker, we are investing an additional £165 million a year to improve maternity and neonatal care, rising to £186 million per year from April. This will increase the number of midwifery posts and improve the quality of care that mothers and babies receive. And as of October last year, there are 23,000 uh, 100 full-time equivalent midwives working in uh, NHS trusts and other core organisations in England, which is more than 1,000 uh, compared to a year ago and 3,500 more than in 2010. Thank the Minister for that response. The Royal College of Midwives estimates that around two and a half thousand, um, there's a shortage of around two and a half thousand full time midwives um, working in the NHS. I know that firsthand from um, Cosham Hospital in my constituency. It has a wonderful birth centre. It's been closed for most of the last few years because they simply can't get the midwives to staff it and they have to go elsewhere where um, more serious um, uh, cases uh, need to be dealt with. Can I ask the Minister what she's doing specifically about retention of midwives? I know student numbers are thankfully coming up, but there are a lot of um, midwives that are choosing to leave the profession because there's not enough flexibility in their work. I all agree that the career of uh, being a midwife is just one of the most rewarding and fulfilling careers that one can hope for. And this is why we've placed such prioritisation on retention within the long-term workforce plan that we launched last year. Uh, the National Retention Programme for Midwifery and Nursing has pr prioritised five actions to support staff retention, including uh, menopause guidance, because that can be an issue we know from midwives, but also valuing uh, them and their contribution as a key objective of NHS England's three-year plan for maternity services. Thank you, for Thank you Mr Speaker. As well as recruitment and retention, training matters. Anglia Ruskin University, which has a campus in Chelmsford, is the largest provider of degrees in health and social care in the country, training midwives, training nurses, and since the medical school opened, training doctors. Will she back the campaign to expand the medical school in Chelmsford so that we can train even more local people to work in our local NHS? Well, may, may I thank my right honourable friend for raising uh, her local college, which does amazing work for the whole of the NHS as well as in the local area. Uh, I may have to uh, re retain a discreet silence over that particular application, but I know if anyone will advocate uh, effectively for her local area, it is my right honourable friend. Shadow Minister Bella Hongasari. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, recruiting and retraining more NHS staff is crucial for women to get gynaecology, obstetric and maternity care. I'd like to share the story of Sandy Simons. She was told 11 months ago she needed surgery for uterine prolapse. Today, after nearly a year of pain, she is still waiting. Labour candidates like Keir Cousins in Great Yarmouth are speaking up for women like Sandy and for the 905 women waiting more than a year for treatment in Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital. Will the Minister apologise to these women, or like the Prime Minister, will she just walk away? Yeah, yeah. 
Well, I was delighted, genuinely delighted, to welcome the Honourable Lady to uh, the Government's Women's uh, Health Summit this week, uh, to, or last week, to announce uh, the uh, consolidation and, indeed, the improvement on the women's health strategy that this Government has launched. We saw significant success last year with uh, HRT improvements, but she knows, because she attended the summit, that I have just announced a £50 million research fund looking at maternity disparities but also research into very specific, female-specific conditions. And so any concerns she has about operation times, she should take up with the local trust, and they will perhaps tell her just how, what impact the industrial action has had, sadly, on elective surgeries. I know this is an issue close to my right honourable friend's heart, and I pay tribute to her work as vice-chairman of the APPG on radiotherapy. The pandemic, of course, has presented a real challenge in delivering the government's target to diagnose 75 per cent of stageable cancers at stage one or stage two by 2028, but I am pleased to tell the House that we are coming through that, and last year we diagnosed more cancers at stage one and stage two than ever before. The Cancer Research UK has published an ambitious plan, Longer Better Lives, and it reminds us that for some cancer patients, just a few weeks of delay can make the difference to whether they can be offered curative treatment or just palliative care. So will the new diagnostic centres being opened by the government, including at Finchley Memorial Hospital, bring waiting times down and secure that early diagnosis that is so important to surviving cancer? My right honourable friend makes a very important point. Diagnostic checks are a key part of the cancer pathway, and the 150 community diagnostic centres opened by this government, including the one at Finchley Memorial Hospital, will provide earlier diagnostic tests, support early diagnosis, and bring down waiting times, benefiting millions of patients. These centres have delivered over 6 million additional tests for all elective activity since July 2021, and we expect the Finchley Memorial Hospital CDC to provide over 126,000 tests for elective care in the next financial year. Channel. Mr Speaker, I thank the Minister for that uh, answer, uh, answer to that response. M- Minister, one of the great things that's uh, so important is research and development. It means that we can find more cures to cancers. My father, who's dead and gone, was a... a, a um, he was a, a recipient of surviving cancer on three occasions. That happened because the advances to try and find the cure. Can the Minister perhaps outline uh, what has been done to work alongside those in research and development to ensure that even more cancers can be cured and we can go from the 50 per cent to perhaps 60 and even 70 of those who live longer? Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, I was delighted that one of my first visits in the new year was to go over to Northern Ireland and visit some of the life sciences uh, companies, particularly speaking to life sciences companies based around Queen's University Belfast. The life sciences sector in Northern Ireland is uh, flourishing. We are keen to support uh, companies working in research and bring together world-leading universities such as Queen's uh, with the private sector and the NHS to deliver improved outcomes for all patients across every part of the United Kingdom. David. Question number 12, Mr Speaker. Minister. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. I know this is an important issue for the Honourable Lady uh, in her role as Chair of the APPG for Sickle Cell and Thalassemia. Uh, we are working hard to provide the best possible care to those living with sickle cell disease. This includes boosting RO subtype blood donation numbers, identifying improvements in clinical pathways and delivering world-leading treatments such as the new blood-matching genetic test announced by NHS England yesterday, which will reduce the risk of side effects and offer more personalised care. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today I welcome and congratulate the launch of a new blood matching genetic test for sickle cell patients by NHS England. However, it has been over two years since the No One's listening report. A key recommendation of this was to ensure that sickle cell patients receive pain relief within 30 minutes of attending A&E. Why is this still not happening for sickle cell patients? And would the Minister like to meet with me and the Sickle Cell Society to discuss how to achieve this? 
Well, I would, of course, be very happy to meet with the Honourable Lady and the Sickle Cell Society uh, to look how we can improve uh, patient experience and ensure that all patients benefit from timely access to the medications that they need. I'm delighted that she welcomes yesterday's announcement. Uh, I think this is an example of how the NHS can bring forward world first and is leading the way to transform patient care and improve patient outcomes. Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Almost a year ago, we published our urgent and emergency care recovery plan. The NHS has already halved waiting time for Category 2 ambulances and brought down waits in A&E. We are determined to cut NHS waits, and our plan is working. Mark Paulson. Speaker, rugby is one of the fastest growing countries in the UK, and whilst we have had additional services introduced at our local hospital of St Cross, my constituents have insufficient accident and emergency procedures. Uh, pr provision. Uh, thousands of local residents have signed my petition for a doctor-led accident and emergency care at the Hospital of St Cross. Uh, I know it's a matter for the ICB, but will the Minister give her support? And as both the previous Minister and Secretary of State have visited, revisited in the last few months, may I invite her to do likewise? Uh, well, I thank my honourable friend for his invitation. He has been a tireless campaigner on this issue on behalf of his constituents. The future of healthcare is about getting people the care they need, where they need it, when they need it, and rugby is no different. New local NHS services are bringing care closer to home in his area, like the new imaging unit at the Hospital of St Cross that opened in September. Access uh, to urgent and emergency care can be greater facilitated when there is greater protection offered to those staff, yeah. particularly many who suffer attacks in emergency departments at hospitals right across the United Kingdom by people who are often intoxicated. Minister. Uh, well, the honourable member makes a really important point that the safety of our staff in the National Health Service is really important, including those in urgent uh, emergency care departments and also actually the ambulance services. So that's one area which is absolutely right to point out, and it is never acceptable for any patient or anyone to uh, be violent towards staff. Yeah. Jeff Smith. Thank you. Question 14. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. We are investing a record amount into NHS mental ser health services, committing £2.3 billion extra a year for the expansion and transformation of services in England, which will enable two million more people to access mental health support. Uh, if only the, the, the reality was that rosy, Mr Speaker. The, the entire sector is calling out for reform of the Mental Health Act. And with our mental health services in crisis, why did the government scrap the long-awaited and overdue mental health bill, which could have started to alleviate pressures on trust by reducing the numbers of people detained inappropriately and making services more fit for purpose? Isn't it true that we need a Labour government to take action on this issue? Yeah. Yeah. Going to be a long year, Minister. <laughs> well, I've, I've got news for the honourable gentleman because we have a plan and it's working. Our investment of £143 million into crisis support is showing early evidence of reducing the amount of emissions, 8% lower emissions, and the crisis telephone services, which are available 24 7, have shown emissions down 12%, and more importantly, 15% lower detentions under the Mental Health Act. We have a plan and it's working. Yeah. Camera. Yeah. Question 15, please, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have made progress against our target to reduce learning disability and autism inpatient numbers in England by 50% since 2015. For people with a learning disability without an autism diagnosis, there has been a 58% net reduction. For people with a learning disability who are autistic, the net reduction is 35%. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you to the Secretary of State for that comprehensive answer. As Chair of the Disability All Party Group, I have been hearing from organisations like MENCAP, who remain concerned people with learning disabilities are disproportionately detained for five to ten years and over ten years. Can she reassure the organisations that the Building the Right Support Action Plan will continue to progress the great work that is yeah, being yeah, done? Yeah, yeah. Well, may I thank my honourable friend for um, her interest in this, but of also, of course, her many years of working as a clinical psychologist, and she brings that experience into the chamber. Uh, National Com Commissioning Guidance to Integrated Care Boards was published in November. It sets out that a mental health inpatient stay for a person with a learning disability should be for the minimum 
minimum time possible for assessment or treatment, which can only pr be provided in hospital, and in overseeing implementation of the action plan going forwards, the Building the Right Support Delivery Board will maintain focus on quality of care and on reducing long state lengths of stay. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's vital for the Government to do more to move autistic people and people with learning disabilities out of inpatient units and back to their communities. What we've seen recently in the trial of staff at Walton Hall is staff who were cruel and uncaring. Delivering sentences, the judge said, Walton Hall was an unpredictable and frightening place to live. Isn't it time the government closed down those units and moved the majority of people into the community? Well, I, I very much thank the Honourable Lady for raising this point, and uh, I think we were all dismayed uh, and uh, upset to see the experiences of residents in those units and indeed the, uh, cr right, the correct criminal outcomes, if I'm allowed to say that, uh, for those who were involved in those assaults. Um, we, uh, there is a review going on as to how um, those issues uh, are affecting the estate as a whole, but we are very, we are very clear that uh, inpatient stays should only be where it is strictly necessary. Uh, and we do have to be mindful, of course, that clinicians will be taking many, many uh, uh, situations into account, including not just the safety of the patient, but also the safety of the wider community. Come to Topical Ruth Gabriel. Topical number one, Mr Speaker. Well, Mr Speaker, women's health needs are often overlooked and under-researched, and through our women's health strategy, this Government is changing this. Last year, we made menopause a priority, helping almost half a million women get HRT for less than £20 per year, and this year, we are building on this work and will have a women's health hub in every integrated care board area in England. We will promote research into conditions that only affect women, like endometriosis and lobular breast cancer, and those that affect women women differently from men, like heart attack symptoms. We have also launched the first research challenge worth £50 million to tackle the maternity disparities that have no place in modern Britain. And following the brave campaigns of the Honourable Members for Hindburn and Stafford, by March we will make dedicated maternal, mental and physical health care available to every woman in England. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I've recently met two constituents with experience of invasive lobular <coughs> breast cancer. ILC is the second most common form of breast cancer, but it isn't generally picked up by mammograms and behaves very differently from other breast cancers. Yet, lobular breast cancer has been understudied, underfunded and urgently needs research funding. Will the Minister tell the House what specific actions her government is taking to address these gaps? And will she also reply to the lobular moonshot project to whom she... Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I gently remind my honourable, the Honourable Lady about the statement I have just given, which was that last week we held the health, Women's Health uh, Summit, at which I announced... Uh, that we are encouraging research into conditions such as lobular breast cancer. And the reason I made that announcement was because of two amazing women who I met very recently, who are living with the condition, who were introduced to me by my right honourable friend, uh, the member for oh. Horsham, and uh, my right honourable friend... Oh, 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 so, please. Can I just say, stop it, I've got to get through a big list. There's lots of members standing. We're going to have to have short... Punchy questions and the same with answers. Right, Andrew Jones. I've been carrying out a health survey delivered to thousands of residents in Harrogate and Esborough, asking them their experiences and views on the NHS. I'll be sharing the results with local healthcare professionals. This project is to support them and their work. When the results are in, will the Secretary of State meet with me to discuss how the results from constituents will help inform and shape our local healthcare planning? Uh, Mr Speaker, I would be delighted to uh, meet my honourable friend to discuss this. He is, as always, an excellent advocate for his constituency, and I will enjoy what, listening to the results of his survey. Shadow Minister Andrew Gwyn. Thank you. Mike Reader, Labour's candidate in Northampton South, shared with me the horrific experience of Stanley, who had severe abdominal pain, called an ambulance to be told it would be hours, so go to A&E. There he was told to wait for an assessment on a patio chair outside. It was three degrees. Who's to blame for this? 
I would say to the honourable gentleman that I'm very sorry to hear of the experience that he describes as a specific uh, constituent, but because of the challenges that we know are faced by the NHS and particularly our urgent emergency care services, that's why almost a year ago we set out our urgent emergency care recovery plan to speed up care for people in any to reduce weights, and that plan is working. We're seeing ambulances get to people quicker, or we're seeing people treated quicker in any. But this isn't a one-off. Why won't she take a shred of responsibility for the chaos her party has caused our NHS? The last Labour government achieved the shortest waits and the highest patient satisfaction in the NHS's history. The Conservatives have delivered the longest waits and the the lowest patient satisfaction in history. Let's get that general election so that she can defend her abysmal record to the public. Well, he obviously wasn't listening to my previous answer. In fact, he was reading aloud. Our urgent and emergency care plan is working. It's reducing weights in A&E. Ambulances are getting to people faster. Meanwhile, I'm sorry to say, in the NHS-run Labour in NHS. A Labour-run NHS in Wales. More than half of patients are waiting over four and hours in A&E. Uh, what steps is the Minister taking to ascertain the cause of ongoing problems affecting access to Rilazole, the only licensed drug for the treatment of motor neurone disease in the UK, to provide clarity for the MND community and ensure normal supply is restored as soon as possible? Um, I thank my honourable friend. We, we absolutely understand how worrying the possibility of medication shortages can be. There is a supply issue with Rilazol 50 milligram tablets, which is caused by a supplier experiencing manufacturing issues. We have a well established procedure in place to deal with such issues, working with the industry, with the NHS, and others to resolve this as quickly as possible. We have contacted other suppliers and we have secured sufficient volumes of stock from alternative supplier. A simple spokesperson, Amy Callaghan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Cancer Research UK have found that too much UV radiation is the third biggest cause of cancer across these aisles. Does the Secretary of State recognise that cost is a barrier to people wishing protect, to protect their skin from the sun, and will she commit to having conversations with Cabinet colleagues to remove the VAT on sun protection products, which will both help protect NHS budgets and ultimately save lives? Well, we see this as part of a, a much wider campaign to ensure that we uh, treat the sun uh, safely, so uh, reducing the amount of time we spend in the sun, of course, particularly at the highest peak uh, hours of the day uh, during summertime, is an important factor. But, of course, I keep all these discussions uh, in play with my Treasury colleagues. Cheryl Murray. Thank you, Seeing a growing number of dentists withdraw from the NHS provision, what steps is the Department taking to ensure vital dental care is provided for everyone, particularly in rural communities? Well, my my honourable friend is a great advocate for her community, and I pay tribute to her for her determination to see more access to dentistry in Cornwall. She's right to do so. We do have a plan which is almost ready, and I do urge her to wait just a little bit longer. And she, like all colleagues across the House, will see significant and real measures to improve access to dentistry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Any staff have expressed concerns around the Anesthesia and Associates and Physician Associates Order 2024? Can the Minister tell me if there are going to be resources needed for the AAs and PAs to be properly supervised by doctors at a one to one ratio? And will the Minister meet with trade unions and professional bodies as a matter of urgency to clarify the Government's position on this hugely important public health issue? Thank my Honourable. Uh, friend for his, his comments. Uh, PAs and AAs are an essential part of the reform piece, the long-term workforce plan. The order uh, I noticed last night went through this House without division, so I am grateful for the cross-party support behind that. We are working with the GMC, we are working with the BMA and others to ensure that the regulations are fit for purpose, and we look forward to the GMC launching their consultation on the fine print of the regulations uh, very soon. And the wheeler. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, as my constituents have to travel to Tamworth, Burton, or Derby for diagnostic tests, can I encourage the Minister to look favourably on a bid for a new, much needed community diagnostic centre in South Derbyshire? 
Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I thank my honourable friend sincerely for her question. Uh, the good news is that community diagnostic centres have now delivered over 6 million additional tests and scans since July 2021, thanks to the hard work of NHS staff. But I will, of course, be delighted to meet her to discuss her plans for her local constituency. Derek Twitt. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, New British Heart Foundation analysis shows that the number of people dying before the age of 75 in England from heart and circulatory diseases has risen to, the, risen to the highest level in over a decade. The rate of premature deaths from cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease has now increased in England for three years back to back. Can I ask the Minister why the Government is taking such a long time to get to grips with this crisis? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The NHS Long Term Plan has committed to a number of key ambitions to improve care and outcomes for individuals suffering from cardiovascular disease, including enhanced diagnostic support in the community, better personalised planning and increasing access to cardiac rehabilitation. These ambitions will support the delivery of the aim to prevent 150 heart attacks, strokes and dementia cases by 2029. Mr. Brain, Speaker, the single biggest concern my constituents raise about health care is over access to GPs, especially in Blackrod and West Horton. So what more can my right hand friend do to make sure we have better GP access? Uh, well, I'm pleased to tell my honourable friend that our NHS long-term plan has set out a real terms increase of at least £4.5 billion a year for primary and community care by 2023-24. Uh, we now have over 2,000 more GPs, full-time equivalents, working in our NHS, and we've had the amazing achievement of more than 50 million more appointments per year, beating our target several months early. Things are significantly Significantly improving, and there are many more measures that I'd be delighted to talk to him privately about. In Cheshire and Merseyside, between April and June last year, the 62 day cancer waiting time target wasn't met. If the target had been achieved, around 150 extra patients would have been treated on time. What would the Secretary of State like to say to those 150 patients? The 62-day backlog has fallen since its peak. The backlog has fallen by 27% since its peak in May 2020. We know there is more to be done, and that's why we are bringing forward more measures as early as possible. In April 2023, over 9 in 10 patients, 90%, started their first cancer treatment within one month of a decision to treat. James Morris. Mr. Speaker, many of my constituents who use the Regis Medical Centre have been left angry and frustrated by the botched implementation of an Animar uh, booking system, um, leading to them not being able to get their appointments and not being able to get the treatment that they need. Would the Secretary of State meet with me to discuss how we can learn the lessons from this botched implementation and to make sure that trust in that GP surgery is restored? Uh, yes, happy to. Sir, Mr Speaker, I recently met with a pharmacy in Bruton in my constituency to hear about some of the challenges they are facing. Community pharmacists are dispensing some of the country's most widely prescribed drugs at a loss, therefore subsidising the NHS. What steps is her department taking to prevent the closure of community pharmacists? We are ensuring that community pharmacists have an even greater role in primary care than they have uh, already. Uh, for example, the rollout of Pharmacy First, we have seen the first stage of that in December with blood pressure checks and contraceptive care being rolled out, and I'm uh, very pleased that we are on track to deliver Pharmacy First, the full rollout, by the end of the month. So, Jeff, it. Mr Speaker, the colour of someone's skin should not impact the reliability of medical devices, but we know that's what happened during the pandemic uh, for many black and Asian patients. That's why I commissioned as Health Secretary an independent review of the equity of medical devices by Professor Dame Margaret Whitehead, that report was published and handed to the department in June of last year, but the department has not yet published it or responded to it. Now, I know that my right honourable friend cares about health inequalities as much as I do. Can I ask her to publish it with a full government response as a matter of urgency? May I thank my right honourable friend for commissioning this vitally important piece of work. Uh, I am giving this my closest attention, and I very much hope to be in a position to answer his response in due course. Karen McCarthy. This week, the Riverside unit in my constituency, which treats young people with severe eating disorders, has had to temporarily close because of concerns about its ability to provide safe care. 
What is the government doing to ensure that young people who are often go through mental health crises <coughs> as a result of their eating disorders get the care that they need as close to home as possible? Well, the Honourable Lady will know that we're investing more in mental health services, particularly for young people and particularly for eating disorders, and we're seeing uh, more young people quicker than ever before. But if there is a particular local issue that she has, I'm very happy to meet with her to discuss. Kevin Foster. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The opening of a new operating theatres block next month marks the latest investment in Torbay Hospital. But, of course, this will be a prelude to the major rebuild. When does the Secretary of State plan to give the next update on the progress being made with that project? Yeah. Uh, I'm delighted that the House is as happy about the expansion as, uh, as he and I are. Um, I will uh, meet the Honourable Gentleman to go through his plans because I know how carefully he has campaigned for this important new asset in his constituency. Catherine Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In the early hours of Friday morning, I arrived at the Royal Lancaster Infirmary with my sick son in an ambulance, and the nurse who was treating him, as we walked past trolleys in the corridor, said, Our A&E is too small. We were promised a new hospital four years ago, yep. but I think they've forgotten about us. Wow. Uh, can the Minister tell my constituent whether or not we have forgotten about the new hospital in Lancaster? Yeah. Wow. Uh, well, the Honourable, Gen- the Honourable Lady sorry, knows uh, my uh, uh, knowledge not only of that hospital but of her local area. Uh, I will look into this matter for her because I want to ensure that the good people of Lancashire, Mr Speaker, are looked after as we would all hope and expect. Forward to one at Chorley. Jeremy Quinn. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I warmly welcome what my right honourable friend last week said about encouraging research into lobbying of breast cancer? And I'm looking forward to meeting the Health Minister shortly to work out how we operationalise what is her clear ambition. May I thank my right honourable friend for bringing uh, two amazing women, along with my right honourable, fr- my honourable friend for Bishops Auckland, two amazing women to talk to me about the impact on lobular cancer. Just to uh, assist members across the House, we have g- sent out uh, a dear colleague letter and graphics last week about the women's health strategy so we can all help our constituents understand what this cons- Conservative Government is doing to ensure that the health care of women is faster, simpler and fairer. That completes questions. Bench, move round. 